Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this uh, December evening. We were relieved there's no snowstorms or ice storms happening at this moment, uh, but because uh, we're really excited to share with you uh, tonight's Burlington Geographic uh, presentation. Has anybody been to a Burlington Geographic presentation before? A few people have. We took a two-year hiatus and we're back. Uh, and so I'm going to be doing a little bit of the review of the topics we've covered before in this series in just a minute as a part of my intro. But mostly I'm here to welcome you and let you know my name is Walter Pullman. I'm a faculty member at the University of Vermont, Vermont in the Rubenstein School. And I'm an ecologist. And I'm really obsessed with with places. Whoops, are those? I'm seeing little messages come up. They're not coming up there. That's good. Um, uh, really inhabited landscapes. I love to um, study the human connection with, uh, with places, especially through time. And that's really what the, tonight's uh, presentation really features. And as you know, and hopefully it, it triggered you to come out, this whole idea of, of human health in the environment, especially here in Burlington in our lives. And how this is unfolded through time is the theme of our presentation today. And um, basically, uh, it's going to feature a landscape that we're sitting in right now that you know well. The city of Burlington is the, the stage on which the stories of human connection with the environment have been playing out for over 10,000 years. As we know, uh, Abenaki people have, have lived and thrived on this landscape for a long time and are still part of our communities today. And uh, they have a lot to teach us about living in a healthy way with our, with our environment. And uh, the program is part of uh, something I've been involved with for a long time. It's called uh, PLACE is what I'm interested in, but it actually is an acronym. And it stands for Place-Based Landscape Analysis and Community Engagement. And really what I do as an ecologist is analyze landscapes from multiple perspectives. And uh, so the PLACE program is a, is a linked program of UVM and Shelburne Farms. I, I think probably Shelburne Farms needs no introduction as really a hub of learning, of sustainable agriculture and environmental education, and really education for sustainability, which is going to be woven in uh, tonight. And the mission of, of PLACE is really this. It's really to, to promote a sustainable relationship between people and their local landscapes. And we really do that by celebrating the intertwining of nature and culture at the landscape level and how that's played out. And really, this theme of health is right at that intersection that we're going to be exploring uh, tonight. And um, I did want to mention that we have just a great uh, network of folks involved in this. And I just wanted to highlight it's certainly UVM and Shelburne Farms. But beyond that, you're going to hear from Burlington Electric Department tonight. And uh, the Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront has been a major supporter. Schools are critical. And so the Burlington School District, and particularly Burlington City and Lake Semester, has been part of this as well. Main Street Landing, I'm really thankful for hosting us. They, they call this, uh, I forgot the tagline, but it has, uh, it's celebrating, providing healthy places for people to convene. And this really has that written all over it. So we're really grateful. And also to RETN for filming this tonight. So if you get excited about the themes, you don't have to remember everything. You can just point people to the website and they can watch this uh, probably starting next week sometime. It'll all be out there and rebroadcast. And many other groups are involved. So we're thankful for the sponsorship of the Burlington Geographic program. And as I was mentioning, this is, uh, this is actually the ninth installment of the series. So if you haven't you haven't been to this. You can binge watch all the ones that came before. Uh, and I'm going to give you a brief preview of yeah, the ones that we've covered. Because really, the whole idea is looking at the landscape um, from an integrated perspective that integrates nature and culture and the unfolding stories that have taken place through time in this particular spot. And Burlington is just an incredible place to look at this. And one of our big themes is really what's happened it historically has shaped the present, but also uh, it helps us think about what a sustainable future looks like in this place. And that's a theme you'll hear a lot about tonight, past, present, and future on the Burlington landscape, connecting people and uh, the natural world. So here's a, a brief retrospective uh, on the last uh, uh, set of programs. We really featured. Uh, part of the time, the nature of Burlington. I know probably some people are here from the Master Naturalist program. Is that true? Is anybody in that program? I see a few hands raised. And this is a group of people that are diving directly into the, uh, the nature of Burlington. And we had several um, series of uh, presentations on that featuring the first one we did was Burlington Underfoot. It was all about the geology of Burlington and the fascinating story of places like Rock Point. 
And um, then the urban wilds of Burlington is actually a fascinating story. You know, Burlington's 50% open space, and a lot of this, thanks to people like Alicia Daniels and others, are really kind of promoting how critical that is to the health of our community, and that's the health of the more than human world. So that's been featured and continues to be. Where the wild things are is really, you know, who are the wild neighbors? You know, everything from bobcat to moose that show up here to otters and mink, uh, and all the tracking and citizen science work that's gone into that. So that's a fascinating one to watch with all the webcams that are set up around Burlington or capturing the movement of these creatures. And then my, one of my, I'm, I'm passionate about birds, and so during uh, the peak of bird migration a few years ago, we really featured the birds on the Burlington landscape and the number of species that you can encounter here. So those are all ones you can check out, featuring the nature. The other part of the series really focused on systems in Burlington, because really it's looking at Burlington really as a place, but a place as a social ecological system, this integration of you know, people and the more than human world as well and which are critical to how we live and how we remain healthy and a lot of them have to do with water so there's a lot you'll hear a lot about water tonight burlington's water systems megan moyer from the city gave a great presentation diving into the history of the waterworks essentially uh, transportation systems fascinating in burlington has so much to do with our economic systems how we move around uh, Burlington Illuminated really dealt with the energy systems in Burlington through time, and we're going to be hearing more tonight from Jen Green about that uh, and uh, the, the trajectory of the city as well. And then really key for our theme tonight is food systems through time, and, and Burlington just has a fascinating integration of different cultures that have uh, been part of this landscape. And uh, all of these are viewable on the uh, Burlington Geographic website. So if you want to go there, uh, check it out. You can, you can see these uh, presentations, thanks to RETN, who's been filming these. The one system I didn't mention yet, uh, and that's education systems. And I'm really excited uh, that uh, tonight's program really builds on uh, this idea of an education network that is, is fairly new, but it's called the Greater Burlington Sustainability Education Network. And it's a group of educators and different organizations who are all working to promote sustainability, and particularly the sustainable development goals. Some of them we're going to be featuring tonight are on this poster here that have everything to do with health. And uh, but there's 17 of them. And this group has really been working on that. Many partners are involved in this network. Again, UVM, Shelburne Farms in the city, and many other uh, universities, informal educations, high school groups, different schools are involved. And some of you may remember back in September, we hosted uh, an international gathering of uh, groups that, uh, from around the world that are fostering sustainability in their communities. This was the UNRCE, it stands for Regional Center of Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development. And we hosted uh, people from essentially Argentina to Bogota to Saskatchewan right here in Burlington. And we're looking specifically at this same theme of human health and the environment, because it's, it's critical. Uh, and when you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them, many of them are very related to human health, human well-being, and environmental health and ecological sort of well-being, and how those fit together. So that's really the theme that we're, we're, we're driving at tonight. And it's really the ninth in this series. It's kind of, if you look at a social ecological system, we're trying to look at sort of a meta goal for the system in terms of sustainability. And it really resides in this area of health health's in the middle of many of these. You could probably put any of the sustainable development goals in the middle and it would link to many others, but in this case we're really featuring how health connects. And again, we're featuring these and um, we've got a great uh, lineup of people and I'm really grateful to these folks for coming out and being a part of this. Here's, here's how the program is going to flow. In a moment, I'm going to turn it over to my insp inspiration, <laughs> Dr. Christine Vitovic, who teaches a course in human health and the environment and she's going to be uh, guiding us through this and setting the stage. Then my good friend and colleague Jane Dorney, who's a historical geographer, will taking us into the past, grounding us in place and looking at how human health and the environment have been intertwined through time. Then we'll take a break. There's posters and Shelburne Farms has graciously provided some cheese and things out there. We'll take a break, but we're gonna come right back in, uh, whoops, for the second half. And uh, we'll, there'll be a, a video that students from um, Christine's class have made all about this theme. Uh, then Jen Green from the city is going to talk about the recent initiatives that connect to human health with energy. And then we, I'm really thrilled we have a, a, a panel here from the Vermont Climate and Health 
uh, alliance uh, to really think about how climate change and human health are intimately connected and the critical importance of looking at this from a human health perspective. And then we'll have Christine come back to wrap it up with some present day issues and also do some Q&A from you. Okay, so that's the plan. We hope you'll stick with us the whole time. I think it's gonna be a great evening. There'll be a chance for uh, questions at the end. So I'm gonna bring, uh, ask Christine to come up and turn it over to her uh, to take us into this theme. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having the foresight of being members of this group of people who really want to focus on health as we move forward into the future. Thanks so much to Walt for pulling us all together. I'm really excited to see what everybody else here has to share and how we can tie it all together and work together as we move forward. So I am Christine Vitovic. I'm a, a faculty member at UVM. And I do teach a course in human health and the environment, as Walt said. And in my course, we start by defining health. What does health mean? And I'm going to ask you all to just take a minute and think for yourself. When you think of yourself as a healthy person, what are some of the things that come to mind? What are some of the actions that you're taking when you are feeling healthy? What are some of the things that you have surrounding you in your environment that make you feel healthy? And just think of those for a moment. And I'm going to share with you the definition from the World Health Organization that we use in my class and that many people in our country use for defining health. And it really focuses on these three key pieces physical, mental, and social well-being, rather than just the absence of disease. So we think about that in my course, and I hope that you're thinking about that. And those pieces that you had just conjured in your mind as to what it means when you feel healthy, I want you to take a second and see if all of the things that you thought of actually fit into these three pieces. Do they fit into physical well-being? mental well-being, social well-being, is there something else that came to your mind that didn't fit in here? And I'll ask you to now turn to a second definition that we like to bring up, which is a little bit broader. And it doesn't go just into individual well-being, but it expands out to the whole community. and that an individual cannot be healthy unless their whole community is healthy. And we like to build upon this in thinking not just about the community of people who we are members of society with, but the community of all living things and the bedrock upon which we stand and all of those systems that Walt was mentioning. How do all of those pieces come to play together to help us be healthy humans? So let's take that piece with just a few of these components, physical, mental, social well-being, add in spiritual. Many people feel strongly that they can't be well without spiritual well-being. And that broader idea of community, we can't be well unless our community is well. And let's say that, OK, well, this might give us some form of a robust definition for health. But is health all that is important to us? And a lot of people say, well, you also should throw happiness in there. Because you can't truly be well unless you are happy. And here are some of the things that we consider to make us happy. There are others that you could add to this list. Many people often think of really good food or great music or um, different ways of being and expressing themselves in the world through art. And we'll take this list here and all those other pieces and just think, OK, if we are healthy and happy, hmm, maybe that's when we can flourish as humans. Maybe that's what the real goal is for individuals and for communities, is to promote human flourishing. But in order to flourish as an individual or as a community, we must also have a healthy environment. And so we move into this idea 
Human flourishing is dependent upon a healthy environment, getting very much some of the things that Walter was just introducing with the sustainable development goals. And let's think just for a minute about a few key pieces of that. Clean air. Clean air is really important because you can only live for about three minutes without air, <laughs> right? Very basic level. Air is really important. And if you broaden that out a little bit, we start to see, well, gosh, you know what? If we have clean air, it helps us in many other ways. For one example, we have clean air. You can breathe easy out in the world doing physical activity, something that I'm going to return to um, towards the end of the program tonight. So just keep that in mind. Because when you don't have clean air, as we saw in Delhi very recently, there are restrictions placed upon people for even going outside. So if you are living in a polluted air area, you're not even supposed to go out and breathe that air because it can become very problematic to your health. Let's think about water, a theme that you're going to see return to throughout the evening tonight. Here we go. So with air, you can survive for three minutes. <laughs> Without water, you can only survive for about three days. So water, also integrally important to the human body. But beyond that, it helps us to function physiologically. It also ensures, for example, our healthy food supply. If the water is healthy, then the food that we eat that comes directly from that water is also healthy. We think here sometimes of uh, restrictions placed upon eating fish because of mercury contamination, for example. We need to keep our waters healthy so that we can also be healthy. It's that cyclical combination of human health and environmental health being inextricably linked. And I'm going to return to this again because I really think physical activity is a hugely important piece of health and well-being. If we have healthy water, we have more opportunities for physical activity. And we've seen some impairment of our waterways here. How many of you have gone down to a beach at Lake Champlain and seen a sign there that there's a cyanobacteria bloom and you can't go in the water? So many people have seen that. If you haven't seen it yourself, you've probably seen it reported in the news. So how do we work as a community to prevent those sorts of things from happening so that we can go out and enjoy this water and promote human flourishing, our health and our happiness? Biodiversity. So biodiversity is key for many different components. One thing is our own food security, which is another theme you will see throughout tonight. When we have biodiversity, we can minimize pests in the field, for example. We don't have to use as many pesticides. We can have a more integrative approach to agricultural systems, for example. And returning to this idea of how long can we survive without these things, you can only survive for about three weeks without food. So three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. These things are really important to us on a very individual body level. Resilient ecosystems, this is one that um, we don't necessarily always think of, but is integrally important to health. One example here is this idea of ecosystem services, that when you have a healthy ecosystem, for example, a wetland, it is able to filter, purify the water for us. Um, it also can absorb water during flood events, which we're seeing more and more. There were some studies conducted here at the University of Vermont within the past few years, um, looking at different places around Vermont that had healthy wetland ecosystems compared to those that didn't. And the effect of those healthy ecosystems being able to absorb water during Tropical Storm Irene places that didn't have a healthy upstream wetland were much more likely to experience flooding and problems with health and safety for people compared to places that did have that healthy upstream wetland. Green spaces, this is an area that I know many people in the audience have been interested in this idea of nature contact and health. And we're seeing more and more at Shelburne Farms. There's a program for forest bathing, for example. And there's more research being done on all these components of being out in nature and how it can benefit you in many different ways. 
And this is a topic that I'm personally very interested in as well. Um, again, you'll see my recurrent theme of physical activity. If there are beautiful places to get out into, we are more likely to get out into them and be active in those spaces. And when we're out there, it can reduce our stress, our anxiety. We have better attention restoration. So if you are a student in the audience coming up on exams, or if you're a person who has a an approaching deadline that you're trying to meet, it's actually really helpful and beneficial to that deadline, that studying. If you take a break outside, even for just 15 minutes, when you return to your task, you're much better able to focus. So just having that green space, that natural environment to venture off into, even for a short period of time, can really benefit your mental well-being and capacity to learn and to be human. And finally, stable climate. This is something I'm particularly interested in with the second half of our program in hearing some of the recent work that's being done here in Burlington and in Vermont on climate change because when we have a stable climate, all of these other things can happen. We can have a safe food supply. We can have um, productive ecological systems, we can have clean air and clean water when we have a stable climate. So everything kind of grows from climate. And one of the last things I want to leave with you with right now is just this idea of this cyclical component that human health is very much dependent upon a healthy environment. And something you're going to see particularly at the end of the talk, at the end of tonight, is that the reverse is also true. There's this very important link between human health and a healthy environment. When we are healthy, we, in my work, we require a lot, less, a, a lot much less health care. And when we require less health care, we have a much lower carbon footprint, pharmaceutical pollution footprint, and different components of environmental footprint that then lead back to the environment. So I want you to remember that it's very much a cyclical operation between environmental health and human health. And that it's not just a one-way direction, but that the way that we treat the environment comes back and treats us in that same way. So can we promote healthy environments that promote human health? Can we promote human health in ways that also encourage a healthy environment? And with that, here are those pieces coming back together again, that cyclical component. And I am now going to turn it over to Jane, who's going to present with us some of the historical applications of understanding health in Burlington's history. Thank you, Christine. So you're going to be bookmarked bookending both end of our, our evening. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm here to talk about humans and the environment in Burlington through time. And uh, we're going to do 250 years in 30 minutes. So I'm warning you ahead of time. All right. Here we go. All right. So we're going to focus on the environment and human interactions in this talk, focusing especially on trees and forest cover and water talking both about lake water and the river water in the Winooski. Looking at human actions and looking at the human health effects of the actions. All right, so here we go. Burlington's environment through time, this 250 years, there have been dramatic changes. I picked this time period because of that. We'll be looking at tree numbers are changing, location of trees changing, diversity, water quality especially. Looking at major patterns in approximately half century intervals. Okay, it kind of it kind of organizes itself that way. Um, I'll be giving you some specific examples to illustrate these large trends. But again, it's 250 years in 30 minutes, so it's going to be just really big, the big scale. All right. So let's go back 250 years, late 18th century, um, in Burlington, and we'll talk about this first time period to the middle of the 19th century. So what was here? What was here? Pre-European landscape was primarily a forested landscape in Burlington, a mature forest. There was a Native American presence, uh, estimated to be several hundred acres, 
cleared along the Winooski, not forested, um, in, the, in the Intervale when Europeans arrived. There's a lot of archaeological evidence um, in the Intervale. So 5,000 year old evidence of hunting and foraging, 1,000 year old evidence of farming of corn, beans, and squash that continued for, for many decades, many centuries, uh, hundreds of years. Um, Jess Robinson, the, the state archaeologist, has very recently done several talks, um, the archaeological history of Chittenden County, the archaeology of the Burlington Intervale. So if you want a lot of detail, which is beyond the scope of our talk, my talk today, you can look at these. These are online. These are videotaped. Um, they are great. I went to both of these talks. Uh, highly recommend them. So if you want to pursue that, go for it. So let's talk about these forests here, uh, the late 1700s in Burlington. This is a map of, of a, a, the uh, part of uh, Chittenden County that includes Burlington. Uh, let's see if I can get this little arrow to work. The arrow work. Hmm. Not going to get the arrow to work. Drag it across. It's not, it's not, I can't get it to, to oh, there it is, there it is. Oh, thank you. So, <clears throat> orient you, this is Lone Rock Point here. This is Apple Tree Point here, okay. So Burlington is kind of this area right here. All right, so you've got a lot more, you've got Colchester in here, you've got other towns as well. But I wanted to give you the context. Um, let me go back here. Um, so mostly pitch pine oak forest in Burlington, what is now Burlington. Um, most people have never actually seen this. There's very, very little left in the state of Vermont. Um, this grows on sandy soils. And Burling most of Burlington was the sandy soils. It was a delta, a river delta. The Winooski River, um, when the lake level was higher, the delta um, was formed. And so all of this, where is this? Where is it again? There we go. So all of the stuff where it says pitch pine oak here on this map, all of this is that big delta of the Winooski River coming into this higher level lake and Champlain Sea. Okay. Relatively flat, think about the new north end, relatively flat river delta, glacial age. So mostly pitch pine forests, uh, oak forests on these sandy soils. There's some riverine floodplain forest as well along the Winooski River. Um, that's the dots that you see there. Um, here, this stuff here. So the Winooski is running through this map here this way. So some floodplain forest, um, a little bit of uh, some, some conifer swamp um, as well, but mostly pitch pine oak. Okay. All right. So on top of this natural forest, Europeans arrived, and they laid this geometric, this abstract idea, this geometric grid on top of this natural landscape. Okay. Um, this map was, this, this, this geometry was put on here by the colonial governor of New Hampshire in the 1700s. He literally drew the lines on a, on a desk um, in, uh, in New Hampshire for this is this, what was the city of, uh, the town of Burlington. And if you look at this, you'll realize that this includes what we now call South Burlington as well. That comes into the story a little later as well. But what they did was he was drawing mostly 100 acre farm lots. You'll see all those rectangles there with numbers in them. Um, so Burlington was, was, um, was divided up this way, uh, mostly 100 acre farm lots. The idea was that one family would buy each lot and 100 acres would support a family in that time. There were also small village lots at the waterfront here, though. You can see for Burlington, there's this little patch here where the village was, was designated to be. Okay. All right. So early Burlington, so we're going to talk about the village first, and then we'll talk about the farmland. So the village area was cleared and settled in the 1700s. The early village streets were laid out in 1798. So they went from Pearl Street up here in the north to Maple Street in the south, uh, whoops, don't do this. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Um, uh, Winooski Avenue on the east and uh, Battery Street on the west. Really, it was kind of five blocks by like six or seven blocks, and that was it, okay? That was it. Um, so this was uh, Burlington, the village of Burlington for decades, decades. All right, so little village. And then the farms. I'm going to give you an example of one of the farms. 
Um, but there were many, right? Many, many, many. This is Colonel Pearl's house. Um, this is that big yellow house that's up at the top of Pearl Street and Colchester Avenue on the north side of the green at the UVM. Big house there, right? You with me? Um, this was built about 1790, one of the first houses built in Burlington. There were only three buildings on Battery Street when this one was built. It's a 50-acre lot when he um, did this, so it had already been divided in half um, from the 100 acres. But to give you a sense of how this developed, um, when this house was built, it was built in the woods, in the, in the forested landscape. Um, the lake was hidden. So even though it was at the height of land for the city of Burlington, you could not see the lake from there until 1806, so 15-ish years before enough of the forest was cleared away from the house so you could see out to the lake, even at that elevation. Okay, gives you a sense of the speed at which the forest was being cut, okay? There is a map of this guy's farm. Um, there is his, his lot, lines go here, kind of up and down. This is a beautiful hand-drawn map, a little confusing to read, so I'll help you with that. But it shows on here what some of his, what some of the, the breakdown of the property use was. And up here in the top, it actually says woods and pasture, 25 acres, okay? This here, this uh, sort of trapezoid is, a, is the uh, rye field, a nine-acre rye field. Okay. So now you're that part of Burlington, you think city, right? This is the early 1800s. This was farmland, okay? And this was repeated over and over and over again, all the way around that little village that was down at the waterfront. The rest of Burlington was farm after farm after farm after farm, okay? For many, many decades. So, talk a little bit more about the trees in that time and farmland. So the native forest was cleared to establish these farms. The house sites first, usually, barns go with that. The crop fields, they were added incrementally um, on over the years, pasture. Um, they, they pastured usually in the woods early on until they were able to clear pastures. They always kept wood lots, though. And the wood lots come into the story several times, all right? So remember that. There were non-native trees planted for the first time that were specifically for farm use. Okay, these are the black locust trees, and you see these everywhere in Burlington. Um, these were planted from about 1820 to 1850. Um, this was the way farmers solved the problem of how you're gonna fence the field. Burlington, with its really sandy soils, has no stones. There's no stone walls in Burlington, right? Even though it was all farms. It's all, no stone walls, so they were using wooden fences way before barbed wire, way before barbed wire. So one of the things they figured out by this time was that black locust, which is native to sort of Pennsylvania and the Southern Appalachians, is very, very rot-resistant wood. So it made great fence posts. But the other thing about it is, you plant this tree or a set of trees, and usually they planted them near the house in the barn, and then you let them go for a little while, and they root sucker. The roots grow out, and then they sucker, and then you send up little shoots, okay, all around the original tree. And the root suckers, by the time they were about 10 years old, they're exactly fence post size. You can leave the original trees and you can harvest those root sucker for fence posts forever, right? So these are all around Burlington, planted by the farmers for their fence posts. The trees are still there. Many of the, bar the barns are gone, most of them. Some of the houses are there, but many of them are gone as well. But the trees are still there, okay? So the, when you see those black locust trees, you should say to yourself, mm, Burlington was farmed. Right? Burlington was farmed. All right. Burlington's in the 1840s then, so the end of this sort of period of the, the late 18th century, early 19th century. This is a painting that was done. I love this one. Dense Village Core. And if you look at this, let's see if I can get this to work. This right here, this building here, anybody recognize that building? Yeah? That's the first congregational church on uh, Warniewski Avenue, okay, right there. And if you look at this, this whole stretch here, Warniewski Avenue in this painting in the 1840s is the edge of the village, like that map I showed you, right? So this whole time period, these decades, many decades, this is still the size of the village. This is it, that's where it ends. So you have this dense village core and you can see it's quite, quite dense, but then it's surrounded by 
farmland. They put the cows here right in the, right in the front, right? So you've got uh, everything upslope from there and all around that little village was farmland, even into the 1840s. Very different. I'll talk about the lake for a little while. The waterfront in this time period, um, very busy commercial port. The first wharf was built in 1810. That's at the, uh, what is now the bottom of Perkins Pier. Um, the Erie Canal opened in 1825. Ship traffic increased enormously. Many, many more wharfs were built. Um, the drinking water, primarily from the lake, and everybody lived close to the lake in the spillage part, and cisterns. Cisterns is when you collect water off the roof and you keep it in a tank. Right? But the amount of water you get depends on how much it rains. Okay, think about that for a minute. There were very few wells, very sandy soil, like I said, it's that delta, and to dig a hole in the sand and then get to the water table, you know, it just, it just didn't happen. There are not many wells in, were, were able to be um, used in Burlington. There were a few springs. One really well-known one was um, Pearl Street, where Loomis Street comes in. Um, it's just off of this map. I'll show you another one in a minute where you can see it. Um, there was one private water company that used these springs, uh, the Champlain Glass Company in 1827, manufacturing window glass. Um, there built uh, a, a, an aqueduct system to pipe the spring water down to their plant, and they also had a lot of company uh, housing as well. So they did, that was the first. Let's talk about the Winooski briefly, this area, and finish this off. This is the, uh, I probably love these old maps, 1834 map, the Winooski River. Uh, this side here on the top of that map is the Winooski city now. Okay, so this is Burlington on this, on the, on the bottom down here. The falls is over here, if you want to orient yourself. Okay, it's not shown on the map, but that's where it was. So, what do you have here in the Winooski River? What's going on here? A lot of industry. There was a dam at the Winooski Falls. The first one was built here above the falls. The second one later um, built down below. And it was used to, to power mills starting in the 1780s and continuing well into the 20th century. An incredible source of water power. There's a huge drop there um, used for, for, for many, many, many years. And this will come back into the story in a little bit. All right. Oh, there's the mills. Yep, there's a sawmill, a grist mill, mills to support the farming communities, um, and then a lot of um, mill work to, to, um, uh, for, for, the, for the lumber industry as well. All right, so that's the end of the first piece here. Now let's move into the second half of the 19th century. All right. The railroad arrives about 1850. It's a really big deal for Burlington. The city industrializes and grows. This is the, the one place where the railroad comes to the lake edge in the whole state of Vermont. Okay, so it's a really big deal. And up until this time, there was all of this, this shipping going on. Um, and now you've got the railroad coming to where the shipping um, was centered. So you have this population growth from 7,500 to 18,000, more than doubled in this 50 years. Farms are converted to housing and industrial uses as the city grows, especially the old north end. This is that era when that was settled. Uh, lumber industries on the lakefront, uh, you can see this photograph from the 1890s, incredibly industrial looking. Uh, the Canadians were sending all their lumber down here to be processed, as well as thousands of acres of Vermont wood being processed here and then shipped out by rail or by a ship. Winooski Falls area was also growing very fast. Uh, incredible industrial development there as well. But at the same time, you have trees beginning to be planted. Very interesting. The street tree movement was getting started in the United States, especially in the big cities, but it came here as well. And the idea was you were going to help urban areas that were losing contact with the natural world. And if you look at this picture of Burlington in 1860, the beginning of this sort of half century, there's actually very few trees there, right? This is uh, taken from the steeple at the church, at the top of Church Street. And wow, oh, right. So the people who lived here in this small village, you know, well, how far was it? Four or five blocks before you got to the rural landscape, the farming landscape. There were uh, places where there was still natural landscape, the woodlots and that sort of thing. But even here, 
right? There was a sense that um, we could do better. The medical community got involved in this at the national level uh, and pushed the health benefits of the tree, uh, street trees, and really pushed it along. Some of the benefits they saw then, back then, in the 19th century, some of which will still make sense now. Um, it, that it, the trees purified the air, the street trees would. That was before the germ theory had been really figured out. And they were thinking a lot of human disease was, was caused by these miasmas, they called them, which was they associated with unpure air. Okay. So purifying the air was actually a big deal in their sort of mindset of, of illness. They knew that trees reduced summer temperatures. That was important to them. They knew they shaded uh, they could shade from the sun. They slowed the rain, all, all important. All the roads were dirt roads, just slowing down the rain might actually be a really good idea. It also raised property values when you planted trees, even then. And so you had buy-in, right, at all these different socioeconomic levels. So it happened here in Burlington as well. They planted mostly elms, not just here, but everywhere. They were preferred uh, for street trees in that era. Uh, this is a native floodplain tree in Vermont. So you didn't have to bring it in from out, outside. The nice thing about it for this, uh, this application is a very quick growing. Um, and they will grow in a wide range of soils. It doesn't have to be a floodplain for these guys to grow. They can grow on these street edges, very dry, very different than a floodplain, and they'll do just fine. So they were very adaptable. And then they had this arch shape, absolutely beautiful, shades the tree, but also lets the air flow. And that was a big thing for these guys. So it was just perfect. It was the perfect tree. So that's what they planted. Pretty much monoculture. Um, there's this great place name um, thing here that, that, that I love. Um, so, so there was a street. The street that's next to, between the, the uh, Unitar uh, Unitarian Church and the, what is now the post office. That was built, first put in in the 1830s. And they called it Locust Street after the black locusts of the farms that were on that street. Okay. By the 1870s, they renamed that street Elmwood Avenue. It had made the transformation. The early 19th century was farm. The second half of the 19th century was urban right? housing. And they had planted elm trees on the streets. So just that one name change encapsulates that whole change in that century. Okay. All right. Drinking water. All right, so the city of Burlington became a city in 1865, broke off from what became then the rest of the city, but the rest of the town became South Burlington. So there was a lot of, a lot of thinking about, okay, now that we're a city, what can we do, right? So they did a survey of uh, where everybody got their drinking water from. 14% of the people in Burlington at that time got their water from the lake. Some people went directly to the lake and got it. There was also a company that had uh, water in barrels. They'd fill big barrels and they'd put them on a wagon and then they'd take them through the town and um, sell them. So you could buy lake water in a, in a barrel as well. 38% of the people in Burlington got their water from cisterns. Again, this is rainwater off the roof and you save it and put it in a tank of some kind. 25% from cisterns and wells. 21% from that private aqueduct company. So the Champlain Glass Company, when they went under this aqueduct that they have, and here is where it was, um, Pearl Street and, and Loomis Street, named Loomis Street named after Henry Loomis, who lived there at the end of it. Um, so it became a private aqueduct company. So the piping that had been laid to the Champlain Glass Company, if you lived along that and you wanted to tap in, you had that and pay the money, you had that opportunity. Oops, where did it go? 2% of people got their, their, uh, their water from springs other than this aqueduct spring, and 1% from their neighbors. And that's it. That was it. 1865. Very different than now, right? So what did they do? So 1866, the first city health officer then wrote this report, about thinking about water for the city of Burlington, where we should be going with this. Here we go. Water is said to be the lifeblood of a city. If we were to estimate the degree of vitality possessed by the city of Burlington by the quantity of water circulating through it, we should be forced to consider it an almost bloodless and a very feeble city. 
and then a little bit later in the report, the great purity of the waters of the Winooski River and Lake Champlain, if brought into general use, would prevent many distressing complaints and incurable diseases which afflict mankind, originating from the use of well and spring water. Right. They're thinking about this really hard, trying to figure out what to do. So what do they do? The next year, 1867, they put in the first public drinking water for the city of Burlington. Okay. The city builds the first reservoir at the top of the hill. It's still there. Um, that's on the south end of the University Green. The water was sourced from the lake at the bottom of Pearl Street. The next slide, I'll show you a map that shows you where. But when they added all of this capacity for water and made it accessible to all people in the city, growth was possible in a way that hadn't been before this. Okay. So here's that a map. This is an 18... 60s map, and you can see the water intake, let's see if I can get this to work, yep, right here at the bottom of Pearl Street. So the water was taken out of the lake down here, and the reservoir here is right here up there at the top of the hill. Okay, so, the, so this is 1860, what did I say, seven, when I went in. 1870s, the first major sewers were built by the city, so another service. But let's think about how this worked. There were two major systems that drained into the Burlington Bay. There was an outlet at the bottom of College Street and an outlet at the bottom of Maple Street. And these were straight piped sewage, went right into the lake. And from our modern perspective, you can look at where the water intake is <laughs> and where the two sewer outlets were. And you can see what's gonna, what the next slide is gonna be about probably. Okay. Before this, people would have been using outhouses. Sewage would have been treated, it would have been going into the ground, basically. So this is where the transition happened to putting the sewage into the water and then piping it away. So what happens? Waterborne illnesses rise. In the 1880s and 1890s, there were significant waterborne illnesses documented in Burlington. Typhoid, cholera, other diarrheal diseases. The death rates were especially high for children. Um, so the city, city was very concerned about this, thinking about it. Um, here's a description of some of the uh, environmental issues they were dealing with, and I want to warn you, brace yourself before I read this one, if you're squeamish at all. This is 1896 report. When the water in the lake was low, the sewage ran in an open stream over flats laid bare by the receding waters of the lake and emptied into a small bay or basin connecting with the lake. The stench, which at times arose from this torpid stream, were highly obnoxious and objectionable. Played it right in the line. So this is the end of the 19th century for that. The Winooski River, water quality, some of the same issues. So sewage treatment, had, or sewage um, systems had been put in in a lot of the little, in Montpelier and cities up, upstream. There were eight municipal sewage systems dumping straight into the river above Burlington uh, by the end of this era, and there was also a lot of industrial dumping going on. Most of the industry in this whole state of Vermont was on the waterways for water power. And the industries, the mills and the other industries would dump all of their refuse just straight into the river. That was the way they dealt with it. Right? So by the end of the 19th century, phew. so let's move into the 20th century. How does it all go? Burlington population is expanding, expands south now especially. Waterfront industry is shifting from wood products uh, into fossil fuel storage. There's a big shifts on the waterfront there. The Pine Street industrial development really gets rolling. Lots of big buildings, all those brick buildings were built, lots of uh, uh, housing to go with those. So how does that play out in the environment? What Interestingly, the nature access becomes really important. So the bigger the city gets, the first park for recreation for the city of Burlington purchased in 1907. Some people think that's really late, but that's, that's how it worked. And this was Ethan Allen Park in the, in the New North End. This was one of those farm woodlots, okay? You have this really steep sloped area, um, great rock outcrops, the geology is absolutely fascinating. But if you wanted to plant corn, mm, Right, you want to plant hay, oats, not, it's not gonna work, right? So this was like the back 40, the woodlot of the Ethan Allen farm. Um, you know where the, the museum is, the, uh, the house is. So this was the back part of the farm. 
the woodlot. This was part of the nature contemplation movement at the time. Um, people were um, thinking about how important it was to uh, your well-being to be able to have this a chance to contemplate nature, to actually walk through it or move through it. They built carriage roads in these kinds of parks. Um, so this park has carriage roads. You can ride or walk in them. 16,000 people came to the dedication. That's how important this was, what a big deal this was for the city of Burlington. 16,000 people, a huge percentage. The trolley line was extended from the downtown two miles out to this park, okay? So now you work downtown, you worked at the docks, you worked in a shop. So what, what could happen now? Now, when you were done with work, right, you could get your sweetheart on one arm, you could get your picnic basket on the other arm, you could get on the trolley, right, and you'd go out to Ethan Allen Park and walk in the woods. Lake and beach access. First park with lake beach access was purchased in 1918. Sandy beach, woods, open field. It was a farm in the New North End, purchased from the farmer. And again, this was near that trolley line, Ethan Allen Park. Beautiful postcard from 1938, the North Beach. The urban neighborhood park movement also came into Burlington. This was, a, this was a, something that happened in the 1920s in the United States. This was a social justice movement when you had all of the incredible industrialization, big buildings being built, lots of uh, very um, tight housing uh, for, for, for industry workers, um, there was a feeling that they needed green space for children. There's little pocket parks, even in anything, there was to be a green space for children um, to play in. And so Burlington um, bought into this and planted trees, um, several pocket parks planted trees. The three parks in Burlington that fit this are the Lakeside Park, excuse me, Roosevelt Park and Smalley Park. Drinking water quality improvements. So I don't know where we left you off, right, with the <coughs> drinking water issues. Um, so in the early part of the 20th century, the reservoir, they were working on this, how do we get these waterborne illnesses down? How do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? A whole series of steps, which is just a few of them. 1908, they added sand filtration. So the water went through a filter before it was was drunk. Uh, 1910, they added chlorine to the filter. And it wasn't until 1951 they added chlorine right to the water in the reservoir. Okay. Now, sewage treatment. The first plant was built in 1953 at near the bottom of Maple Street where, they, where the, um, one of the sewage pipes had come out. And if you could do the math here, so this, the sewer pipes were put in in the 1870s, and the first sewage treatment was 1953, right? A lot of decades, seven, eight decades of untreated sewage going right into the lake from, from the city. Winooski River, <coughs> primarily a wastewater conduit, as I said. You can see from some of these, this postcard, there was also a lot of farming um, as well, so there still is. So we're almost done here. The second half of the 20th century, right up to the present. Again, more population increase. The New North End, which had been 10 or 12 farms for 150 years, became residential in this era. This is a map from 1958. It's already filling in here. Rise of automobile use. Everybody had to have their car now, right? The trolley lines were closed, but there are a lot of impermeable services that go with that. That increases... Um, with the need for parking lots, which creates a lot more limits to where trees can live when you do that. Okay. Dutch elm disease really hits home here. There had been 10,000 elm trees along the streets of Burlington. Um, by the 1950s and 60s, most of them had died and they'd been taken down. And this uh, view from 1965 is pretty grim, right? So what happened? they replanted the trees. The city really got into this. Major tree plantings by the city to replace those lost elms. They hired their first urban forester. A wide variety of species are planted, not just the one. Right now there's 50 different species. Some of them are native and some of them are not. There are 50 different species now. Many, many new city parks. Big increase in the number of city parks. Different kinds of natural area type parks. Again, a lot of these were woodlots left over from those old farms. Uh, recreational parks, team sports were coming in. Um, big way in American culture. So the city 
that felt like they needed to support that. There are many recreational parks were built at this time and much more lake access, not just North Beach, but Letty Park, the waterfront park and the bike path and Oak Ledge Parks were all added at this time. The lake water quality, right? So there's nutrients, <coughs> we'll call them, in Burlington Bay. Um, concentrations relatively low compared to other lake sections, but um, phosphorus loading from the wastewater treatment plants is trending down now, which is some of the good news. But there are many problem areas, as, as Christine mentioned, some of these already. Beach closure due to E. coli, cyanobacteria blooms from the phosphorus load, again, mo more modern microplastics, pharmaceuticals, and uh, mercury in the fish. The river, okay, this is where it hits bottom. 1968, most of the river was rated class D. This, the state rates the water quality A, B, C, D. A is drinkable, B is you can swim in it, C is you can boat in it, um, and D is <clears throat> can't do anything, right? So high levels of bacteria, floating solids, human waste, and not even considered drinkable with treatment. You can't even drink it if you treat it. This was the Winooski River, okay? in 1968, this was, the, this was the nadir. So in the 70s, things started to really improve though, a lot of energy put into this, the Clean Water Act uh, helped with that. Up to Class C in Burlington now, so all of the stretch of Burlington, uh, of the Winooski River in Burlington is, is Class C. There are many Class B sections now upstream. So you can drink it if it's treated. Um, recreational boating is encouraged, but you really aren't encouraged to swim. But now you can, you can get your kayak out, right? And it can be a very pleasant experience. River access increases during this time period. The Winooski Valley Park District was formed in 1972. They wanted to conserve natural areas along the river and gain access to the river shore and recreation, education. Um, six of their parks are within the city limits of Burlington. So suddenly going to the river was, was a great thing to be able to do. So here's, that, here's a synopsis of where we've been in the last 250 years. For the trees and forests and the water, then in the 1700s, there are about 6,100 acres of native forest. 2019, there's about 325 acres of native forest parkland. About half of that's the, Bonus, uh, the Winooski Valley Park District, half of that's the city, a little bit at UVM. So maybe now 5% forest compared to almost 100%. It's about 12,000 street and park trees, though. Significant number. Um, if you add all of that up, it's been estimated if you look at it from an air, from the air, that Burlington really has about a 43% tree canopy cover. You add all that up, very interesting. The water, the 1700s, the lake and the river water were very clean, all the archeological evidence about what the fish species that were there and the mammal species that were in both of those, uh, indicating very clean water. 2019, we're gonna call it impaired water quality, both the lake and the river, but both are drinkable with treatment now, right? It's not as bad as it was. All right, moving forward in the 20th century, so we're almost done here. Major improvements planned, both trees and water quality. Beneficial tree cover initiatives, the Burlington Wildways is reestablishing three native forests in Burlington. Floodplain forest at McKenzie Park, a pine oak, pitch pine oak forest on North Avenue. I know there are UVM uh, uh, college students uh, working on some of these projects. Maple for uh, Swamp Forest in, uh, at Oak Ledge is gonna be reestablished as well. City is planting 130 to 150 new trees every year. The city climate action goal is 50% reforestation by 2025. That's only about five years away. And I said, like I said, we're 43% tree canopy now. If they're calling tree canopy the same as reforestation. Water quality. This is a little tougher, right? So if you're going to plant trees in Burlington, you can just go out and plant trees in Burlington. But water quality is a much more complex issue. You've got, involves this whole system of watersheds and municipalities. So you've got to integrate city, state, and, and federal um, entities to problem solve here. The state has been working on some incentive programs, the Lake Wise program. Very interesting. Um, they just rolled that out. If, you're a, if, you, if you own lake, front property, you might be interested in this. Very, very interesting. Um, but you've also got the EPA involvement because of the phosphorus uh, issues. So they're keeping an eye on everything. All right, so the 250 years, you've seen incredible change. Um, environmental health does matter. Human actions do matter. We can, human actions can improve environmental health. 
and improving environmental health can improve human health. So there's a reason to keep going, right? There we go, that's it. Thank you. In my human health in the environment class, we learned about Nick Mark's sustainable well-being challenges. My favorite one was social interaction. I discovered that spending time with my friends and people whom I loved had a huge impact on my well-being and could have a really low cost on the planet. I also realized that this one can be paired with any of the other challenges and increase your well-being even more by doing, for example, physical activity with some friends. grocery store I have to drive because I live in Essex and I have no grocery stores that are really near me so that is a carbon footprint in itself but I am making sure to bring my reusable bags so I decided to get most of my ingredients from City Market because it is a co-op and they do prioritize organic and fair trade foods so I went there um, for the ingredients that I already didn't have um, I'd say the biggest carbon footprint at this point was having to drive there because I do live in Essex and probably the energy that I'm using. But other than that, I am trying to be environmentally conscious of the ingredients that I buy. I made sure that most of them were organic and especially fair trade. And most of the stuff that I, I already had, so um, I keep using that until it's all gone. lifelong learning um, opportunity was really fun. I was really fun trying to make a new recipe. I made pumpkin soup, which was very interesting. I am not the best cook, but um, it was a great time. I really enjoyed it. It definitely increased my happiness. Um, I kind of zenned out by doing this by myself. It challenged me. Being environmentally conscious while doing it was also really interesting. And from now on, when I try new recipes, I'll definitely make sure to get organic food. And next time, um, hopefully I'll be able to walk to a store that's closer that might have some more ingredients. Thank you, Anna and team. Excellent job. These are students in Christine's class, uh, and I think they all did projects related to this theme of human health and the environment, so excellent. Next up, we're gonna switch gears into part two, and we're really kind of looking into the future now and the forward-looking pieces, and I'm really pleased that um, uh, we're gonna start with Jen Green from Burlington Electric Department in the city of Burlington to share with us some of the latest new initiatives. I know I've heard a little bit about it, but I'm particularly excited to be sharing that tonight, and we're gonna move into uh, climate and health after that. So, uh, bear with me in a second here. We're gonna bring up the lights, and Okay, Jen, come on up. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot, Walt. I, I have really enjoyed tonight. I, I was saying to Jane, I feel like my life is a little richer. Um, from that last presentation, it was so interesting. I walked ironically by... Yeah, that's 
Uh, but if I, do, I, I, do I have to stand behind the podium? How's this? Is that okay? Um, I happened to walk my dog down Mansfield Avenue today, and I was struck by this black locust. And I looked at the crazy bark. And so understanding a little bit more about sort of that and the relationship to the history of Burlington was really um, so fascinating. I'm so, um, was so happy to get here early to hear that. So um, as Walt said, we'll transition a little bit. And I know I have five minutes, so I am going to not say much. So I really encourage you to please contact me if you have questions about things that we don't get to. But in essence, I want to tell you um, where we're going now in, in the city vis-a-vis um, in particular, the energy sector and what we're calling our transition to net zero energy. And I essentially, we essentially define that as transitioning off of fossil fuels, which is a pretty exciting and audacious move on the part of Burlington. You know, in, um, yeah, in 2014, we became the first city in the country to source 100% of our electricity from renewables. So that sort of has sown the earth in preparation for now inviting people to join that grid, come to that grid, and move away from fossil fuels, particularly in the heating and trans ground transportation sector. So um, you can imagine this challenge when you think about our old housing stock. Um, about 90% of us use natural gas for heating in Burlington. The remaining five is what we refer to as unregulated fuels, so that would be propane and oil. Um, so we're going to need to electrify that, and we're going to need to begin to electrify um, the existing vehicles that we have and augment um, the, our biking and walking and multimodal uh, means of, of getting around. So what I want to do is um, take you and show you some of the data of sort of where we are and then um, look at how we're going to get to this, this place of, of net zero energy. So we, we had to do our analysis first to see sort of what the ground truth, the ground truth of our energy sector was. And um, our analysis showed us that um, indeed, if you look at the stripes and then the darkest part of the pie, that's our transportation component of energy use in Burlington. If you look at the light gray and then that darker gray, that's essentially the building sector. Now, because um, the city of Burlington and the Burlington Electric Department in particular really has the most control to the extent that we have over transportation that originates in Burlington, our analysis essentially sort of, at least for now, we're cutting out that, that grid um, part of the pie. So we're not going to be talking about, we're not going to be worrying for the moment about transportation that originates outside of Burlington. So if you cut away that piece of the pie, you'll see that the largest sector for us to deal with is indeed commercial um, and residential building space followed by, by transportation. So that sort of, that's what we got now. And this is what we're going to try to transition um, most significantly. So um, in addition to looking, about, looking at how our energy is currently used, we also looked at where we want to go. We want to do this work by 2030 maybe 2040 if we have to. We gave ourselves another 10 years in the event we don't do it all by 2030. Um, the, the point I want to make here is as we transition off of fossil fuels, again, in the ground transportation and building sectors, we're going to make significant progress on greenhouse gas reductions. So um, you can see the trajectory, the downward trajectory in natural gas and petroleum. And indeed, if we achieve that 2030 goal, we will have reduced our greenhouse gases by 69 percent. And I think that's more ambitious than any climate action plan I've seen. And I, I have the privilege of working with um, cities all around the country. So it really is a significant goal. Now, you know, FYI, if we do, it does take us that extra decade, uh, 2040, we're still looking at a 57 percent reduction in greenhouse gases. So that's still fairly significant. So how are we going to do this? If you think about sort of this pie of pathways, um, there are four key slices of that pie that's going to get us there. Again, we're going to need to electrify our buildings. That's 60% of that big pie. We're going to transition our existing vehicles to electric. That's 20% of our, our work, say. 15% of that work is district heating. And I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of efforts, conversations, reports um, that have been talked about and released 
for three decades, this idea of taking the waste steam, the, even though waste I think is sort of a misnomer because it's just a resource that we're not using, that steam that comes out of McNeil, and you know Jane showed us on the map of course where the Intervale is, the McNeil generating plant is down in the McNeil, I mean in the uh, Intervale. If we can take that waste heat and we can string it up to the university, the hospital, um, you know, this is going to be a tremendous uh, success story for the city of Burlington, particularly as we think about sort of residential heating and commercial heating and cooling. And then last, and I always say last but not least, because although it, it's only 5% of the pie, um, this transition to alternative transportation beyond the internal combustion engine vehicle is big. And it's big because this is a role, like tomorrow, we can all uh, play a role in that in that five percent. So I am not a health expert. So today I was thinking, you know, we off at BED we often talk about the climate um, impacts of this work. We talk about um, sort of the economic benefits if we stop importing fossil fuels. You know, we don't produce fossil fuels or uh, petroleum here in Vermont. So all that money uh, leaves the state. And how much good we can do if we're actually buying our own local electricity. So we always talk about the economic benefits in addition to the climate. Rarely do we talk about, at least not yet, tonight's the launch, um, do we talk about the health benefits. And I think it's really important to move sort of health from the sort of co-benefit thing that's over here and really bring it front and center. So um, pollution, um, transportation is the largest source of pollution in Burlington. Indeed, in America, 150, 000, 150 million people, almost half of the U.S. population, live in areas where the air quality does not meet federal standards. So that's pretty amazing. So if you think about electrifying our um, transportation sector and transitioning as much as we can to bi bi biking, walking, multimodal means of transit, um, we're talking about air quality improvements. And we're talking about equity and health as well. Indeed, it's, um, it's neighborhoods and communities of color that are most adversely impacted by um, poor air quality and, and particulate matter in particular. So um, this is really important when we think about it, this transition in the transportation space. You know, the building electrification um, component also has a huge, huge ramifications for public health. Um, cold climate heat pumps is what we're really advocating for, and I, I don't know how many folks are familiar with this, this new technology, but they're popping up more and more. Um, essentially, there's a unit outside um, that can both heat and cool in very efficient ways using electricity. So we're seeing a lot of new buildings in Burlington actually opting not even to put in gas-fired boilers, to just go right to cold, what we refer to as cold climate heat pumps. So this is great. The challenge, of course, is our is this existing and, and older building stock. Um, but we hear a lot about the connection between cold climate heat pumps, asthma, indoor air quality, and how um, cold climate heat pumps really improve the quality of life in a building. And I was thinking about what Christine said about sort of getting up, moving around, and um, indeed, even inside our buildings, we have a lot of poor um, air quality, and a heat pump can, can really alleviate that and the, the health and sort of um, the, you talked about going outside and you had a phrase to describe how um, your, your brain just sort of kicks in and fires up when you get outside time. Arguably, when you are inside, when you can't go outside, with a cold climate heat pump, you're really seeing a lot of those same benefits um, as opposed to having uh, fossil fuels heating your home. Um, you know, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I think uh, I had about five minutes. I'm probably about there. But I did want to say that you know, as we think about our transition to net zero energy, I think it's important to think not only about sort of what that means for the climate, um, not only what that means for our local economy, but for the health as well. I think, I think together and collectively, if we start sort of driving this theme on health, particularly health from an equity issue, um, we'll have even that more leverage to, to reach success. So thank you. Thanks, Walt. Jen set up, uh, up really nicely for our next group. It's actually a panel of three folks. Um, there's Jen's contact information in here. Uh, make sure you know that. And really from the Vermont Climate and Health Alliance. So it's my pleasure to invite up our team up here. And I'm going to Well, 
All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, what a great introduction all these different talks were to what we do. Um, there's a lot of linkages. You guys want to grab a chair or bring the chair over? Or whatever, however you're comfortable. We can swap yeah. around. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of linkages um, that uh, I'm trying to, hopefully going to give you a bit of a sense of between the three of us. But this is also going to be pretty quick. Um, so please get in touch with us if you're interested in any aspect of what we're talking about. So I'm Dan Quinlan. Um, and I formed this group uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, Megan and Leanne, who you will meet in a few minutes, are members of the group. And we started by simply writing a letter to the legislature and kind of put it out through our networks. And we're doing, uh, and so we were able to pretty quickly get 300 medical and health professionals in the state to sign the letter. And we sent it to the legislature, which got us in to see the governor and the Senate pro tem and other uh, lawmakers and leaders. So um, that's how we started. That's how we got organized. And from there, we've kind of gone down two branches. One is to do things like this, kind of do uh, educational, informational forums about the issues of climate change and health. And then also do a lot of work in the legislature, talking to lawmakers, trying to understand the legislation that is uh, being put forward and what the linkages to health are and working with the advocacy groups to go into the legislature and help them uh, make the arguments. And there was something that Jen said about um, there's an additional factor, economic factor, that people don't think about, which is many of these things, uh, besides having direct co-benefits, have, well, they have other co-benefits that people aren't thinking about that actually also reduce cost. So we, we have this cost element very much in what we do, but we, often, we also are very much making kind of the moral argument about why this is important. So that's our mission. Uh, health equity is a huge part of what we talk about. So we've given a talk uh, with some folks from UVM and the Department of Health all over the state about what we do and how it relates to health equity. And basically, the basic message is that climate change causes all sorts of uh, issues for people who are vulnerable, children, older people, people with chronic illness people, low-income folks, and so we bring forward those um, examples and information about that. There's a really great uh, piece of work that was done by someone from the gun school who went and talked to people from, a, with one of your, your students, right? Uh, talked about, um, uh, interviewed people who were affected by Hurricane Irene and where are they at today and what's, what's the re uh, residual impacts that are still there. And those are very powerful storytelling that we then have gone around the state and talked about quite a bit. So that's a big, big um, topic for us. Um, with respect to Burlington and the kind of local things that are going on, many people might not know, probably most of you don't know, that the um, winter temperatures, the place where they're rising the fastest in all of North America is right here in Burlington. So um, going through 2017, temperatures have risen, um, risen seven degrees over that time period. So we showed that piece of information to the governor and others. This is kind of things like really trying to bring home what's going on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Department of Health work. They're really doing great work. There's a website you can go to, climate um, and health website from the Department of Health. You can find what they're doing. I'm going to give a couple examples of things they're, they're working on. Um, they're working a lot on health. They're trying to, so what they do is they try, try to take the, we the weather forecasting data and the models and, and look at what's going to happen in Vermont with respect to all sorts of issues. So one is heat. What they're thinking about is how many days are we going to be above 87 degrees? How is that going to go forward? How many days per year? 87 degrees is a key metric for health professionals because that's when they start to see people have health-related issues related to heat. They're also uh, um, doing quite a bit of work, as you can imagine, uh, around what was talked about before, around water quality. And same kind of thing, where they're doing modeling, forecasting, and there's a lot of monitoring going on. This diagram here is um, for, you can find online, and it's just a summary of what's happening in terms of uh, beach closures, uh, depending on water quality, as it relates to um, uh, uh, algae blooms. 
And the other aspect, so there's, there's more of that going on, as you might expect. And that's a temperature issue and also an issue of what's going into the water. But the other thing that's happening, that picture on the right was the algae bloom that happened in October, which is much later than normal. So there's another uh, effect here that the uh, period over which these are being seen is widening. So really interesting work. We are tied at the hip with them. Um, and we, what we try to do is take the Department of Health work think about it from a legislative policy point of view, put our spin on it, and then go talk to legislators about it. So with that, I will turn that over, turn it over to Megan. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a family medicine physician. My name is Megan Malgeri, and I work out in Milton Family Practice. And <clears throat> I, my role here tonight is to speak to some of the health impacts that um, we will and we are and will see with climate change. Um, and that's my role and as part of the Vermont Climate Health Alliance. Um, I think as a, as a provider, as a physician, um, we have a unique role to play in terms of being translators of science for our patients and for the community. And so um, I think it's important to speak to the science um, in that aspect and to be able to educate and advocate in that way. And so um, that's what I try to do through this group. And I'm really appreciative of Dan and his work in terms of allowing or uh, creating opportunities for us to, to teach and advocate. And so um, in terms of the, um, in terms of this issue, I believe that um, climate change is one of the greatest public health threats of our, of our time and certainly of our children's time. Um, and I'm definitely not alone in that assertion. Um, the World Health Organization has a list of top 10 threats to human health every year that they publish. And this year, climate change and air pollution is at the top of that list. Um, and um, last year, more than 100 um, healthcare organizations came together and um, had a call to action where um, they listed, you know, climate change is a global health emergency and that we need to take action on that. Um, and so uh, it's a big issue and it's something that is happening now and I see health impacts in my, for my patients um, currently. Um, so I wanna share a few of those with you. I, in terms of the events I see in Milton related to climate change, um, Dan's slide illustrated this well, but I see impacts related to um, extreme weather events, particularly extreme heat. Um, my patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, with asthma, and with congestive heart failure on those hottest, most humid days of the year uh, struggle to breathe and may present to my office or present to the emergency room um, because um, they are more vulnerable and um, more frail and um, that weather exacerbates their symptoms. Um, and in fact, pretty much anyone with a chronic medical ailment or um, condition is more subject to being vulnerable and being subject to effects of extreme heat. Um, and so um, it's not only my lung, lung um, patients though, uh, for example, um, this summer I had a, a patient who is, was a stroke survivor and yet on you know, one of the hottest days of the year, got a little dehydrated, stood up to get to the bathroom, fell down, and ended up having to present to the emergency room. So that's an example of, you know, what extreme heat can do to people. And with, you know, increasing numbers of days over 87 degrees as we our climate warms, this becomes more and more of an issue for our, our vulnerable um, elders and um, people with chronic medical conditions. Um, and it doesn't have to be the very vulnerable either. Um, for example, I have patients who have hypertension, which is an extremely common medical condition that people can have. And uh, the medicines we use to treat those help people lose water so that their blood pressure is lower. And on an extremely hot or humid day, you know, it doesn't take more than mowing the lawn or um, you know, being on a medicine like that to lead to dehydration, to lead to acute kidney injury, to lead to you know, potentially a hospitalization. So those are some of the effects I see day to day in the clinic. And what I worry about for my patients in the future um, 
in addition to all of those events and the, uh, the most vulnerable in our society being the most susceptible to illness and um, exacerbations, accidents related to extreme weather um, includes you know, some of the more extreme uh, weather events that we see in other parts of the country or in Puerto Rico, um, the ex extreme storms, disasters that can impact people and cause just extreme insecurity. Um, with our climate, if we continue to, you know, I, I concern that if we continue to not uh, act uh, rapidly enough or with enough gusto that just um, we can um, have disaster. And um, with these disasters, it's just, you know, I think about for my patients and, you know, for my, my two children, you know, envisioning their life being less secure in so many ways in terms of, um, you know, um, disasters leading to you know, tainted water, tainted food, um, lack of being able to get out of their homes in situations of flooding or um, uh, climate-related disasters and um, the, you know, um, impact of disasters can just be so extreme from death to accidents to um, the, you know, um, emotional strain of losing loved ones or losing pets or friends or um, having to deal with all of that stress and I worry about you know are we going to have wars in the future over resources like clean water and um, so those are some of the things I think about and um, but I do think that there's a lot of um, reason for hope too I feel like we're incredibly we have ingenuity as human beings and that I um, we already have a lot of solutions for, as um, we were just discussing in terms of the technologies we can use, the ways we can be so creative and adaptive. And I think what it takes is really moving to a point where we have um, the public and political will to like reach the tipping point and move towards some of those solutions. But, um, so that's what I have to say. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I'm Leanne Holterman. I work in the Larner College of Medicine at UVM, and I've been working with the VTCHA for the better part of this year, and my role with the group so far has really been trying to leverage the different work of different entities around UVM and connect the different components. So bringing together the College of Medicine with Rubenstein and Gund and some of the different work that's happening across the university. I think a lot of times what happens is people are doing such amazing work, but we're focused on our day to day. And so we end up getting a little bit siloed. So events like this that really highlight where these groups intersect are super important for moving this work forward because just talking to all the people that I've talked to this year, so many people are passionate about this topic um, at UVM and in Burlington. And even tonight, you've seen a lot of different work coming together. And I think if we're going to solve this problem, the best thing that we can do is talk to each other and really leverage these relationships mm -hmm. and bring people together to unite um, in all the different ways that we possibly can to create solutions and use the technologies that we have so far. And part of what I wanna talk about tonight is what do we do with this? This is heavy information. There's a lot of difficult things to process and a lot of hope, as you said too, Megan. But um, where do we go from here? So part of that is, like I said, bridging gaps, talking to people, making collaborations wherever possible, and Gibson's been really great at that. Um, but the point being that we have all of these things at our fingertips and we're not actually addressing the problem completely yet. And we can, but we're not. And so um, even though Vermont has made a pledge, the legislators have made a pledge to reduce our carbon emission levels by about half um, of what they were in 1990 by the year 2028. Unfortunately, we're not even anywhere close to that, and we've uh, our emission rates have risen 16% since 1990. And that's not just a Vermont-centric problem, that's something that's happening across the world. So despite all of the pledges, despite the Paris Climate Accord and all of those things, emissions continue to rise, and we really need to be aggressively lowering them. And every month, every week that passes that we don't actually address that, it continues to be a higher and higher percentage that we have to tackle every year, making it seem that much more insurmountable. 
and you've heard a lot, of, some of uh, uh, the different statistics about this tonight already from our previous speakers, but to look at how can we address this best, it's really important to target the high impact areas. So in Vermont specifically, over 80% of our emissions are coming from some select areas, including transportation and the building industry. And so if we're able to, as Dan said, target some of the legislative action that can happen at our state level to these two particular areas, then we'll be much more effective at more quickly reducing our emissions than if we really spread it out to all the areas. It's not to say that some of these other areas like agriculture aren't really important to be targeting, but given limited resources, given limited time and bandwidth, I think that, that targeting these, these couple areas is super important. So how can we actually make a difference as individual citizens of Vermont? This is where we need you to speak up. And so if you want to help with this, we can go to our, you can go to our website, vtchi.org slash speak up, and we have a couple forms already to reach out to legislatures, so Governor Scott and um, Senate President Ash, as well as the Speaker of the House, Johnson. And it's super easy. It takes a couple minutes. You just fill out a form and it shoots an email to them. And what's cool about living here is that our legislators really respond. And they've said over and over, if we hear from enough people, we really understand that this is an important issue and we'll do something about it. We'll bring it up. We'll institute change. It's one of the nice things about living in a smaller state. Um, and so it's really, really important for us to use our voice to, to use the democratic process to connect with these legislatures. I've sent them emails. I got responses from each of them within a couple days. Um, so I think it's really important and that if you can all go to this website, you'll see this way to reach out as well as some other cool resources that we have as our group of ways that you can get involved. And um, if anybody wants to become more involved with the group in general or know if you're involved in a healthcare profession or know anyone that is, please, we're, we would love to have you join the mission. So I think that's it. Thank you. So I'll just wrap up by saying this is a big topic. You got a little inkling of what we're doing, but we're really, this is where we're going. We're trying to get folks to call the legislature while we're at the same time coming in from the side saying why health is a big issue. and why there's so many health benefits. So the weatherization debate that went on last year, we created a video, we were there doing testimony. There's a huge, really great story about health and weatherization programs, that's energy efficiency in buildings. And then that has this great climate impact. So there's a really nice synergy here. So uh, we think we got a great story. We love to hear from people who are interested in what we're doing. We're trying to make it bigger and go farther. Awesome. We're, we're, we're getting close to the end here uh, tonight, but we're going to invite uh, Christine back up to, to bring us closer. I realize it's 10 of 9, and we want to respect your time. We'll probably go a couple minutes over, but not too much. And uh, so there'll be a chance, hopefully, for some questions. Yes. But I'll turn it right over to you. Right Thank now. you. And I will, I'll do my best to keep us moving for time while also giving you some information that I think will help to tile this together. Now, one of the areas that I focus on in my research is the unintended consequences of medical care, um, which is very much this idea of the give and take between health and environment. And environmental factors can make us sick, and the way that we approach health care can make the environment sick. And so there's this cyclical piece just in the same way that a healthy environment can help us be healthy, and the healthier we are, the healthier our actions are for the environment. So, and it all comes back to climate change in the end. So let's, let's just see where this goes. So one of the areas that I've been working on is pharmaceuticals, and I'm gonna get right into it here and talk about levels. This is where we started. Like, let's just go out and look in the lake and see are there pharmaceuticals out there and there sure are. <laughs> so this, um, there are two graphs here. I'll toggle back and forth between them. This was a study that we did a few years ago, just looking to see at 
the wastewater treatment plant here in Burlington, which Jane gave kind of a, an overview and map of where that is down near the Echo Center, very close to where we are right now. Um, we sampled the water and we were able to test for 110 different pharmaceuticals. And what we found were these 54. There are 54 pharmaceuticals here. Now, the most important thing to see here, there's a lot of information, but to break it down, if I can get my pointer. So this red line shows you 80% removal rate. So each of these, here are the classes of pharmaceuticals. Here are the different specific types of pharmaceuticals. The blue are the numbers coming into the wastewater treatment plant. Red is the concentration of that pharmaceutical leaving the wastewater treatment plant. And what we want to see are these green dots to the right of this red line. Because at this red line, that means that the wastewater treatment plant was effective at moving 80% of the incoming pharmaceutical. What we end up seeing is very few of our pharmaceuticals entering are actually being cleaned out of the water. The technology just is not available worldwide. So we have 54 pharmaceuticals entering and we have basically that same number leaving directly into the lake. So this graph is just showing you that Burlington is not unique. This is not something that's just happening here. Um, on the top here are the Burlington numbers, the exact same data you just saw, but compressed into a different format. And this is comparing to Ithaca, which has a similar um, demographics, similar size. But more importantly, 80% of the surface water, so 80% of the lakes and streams in the United States that have been tested have shown pharmaceuticals in them. So we have pharmaceuticals out there. Okay, so that's step one. Where are these pharmaceuticals coming from? The major source is this wastewater effluent, and there are two primary components. The first is people who have leftover medication dumping those pharmaceuticals down the drain and peeing them out. So those are the two primary routes that we have entering wastewater. So we wanted to know more about this, and we did a Vermont statewide survey, a phone survey, and called people up to ask them about their pharmaceutical purchasing, use, and disposal to try to figure out, well, what is the major source happening here? So what you see here on the top is that uh, most people are purchasing some amount of over-the-counter pharmaceutical or prescription pharmaceuticals within a year. And about a quarter of people are also purchasing additional medications for their pets or livestock. Here are some key pieces. 60% of people had leftover medication, so you end up purchasing more than you actually need. There's one key piece that we'll come back to. In terms of disposal, so people got rid of it, you know, only about a third of people are actually disposing of that leftover medication. This is an important number as well. But here is a really important piece. Only 7% of people who we surveyed are actually throwing it down the drain. So that suggests to us that, yes, actually the main source of this is excretion because our bodies don't fully metabolize these drugs and we're going to be peeing them out. We asked a few other questions that helped us indicate a little bit more information. One of the questions was, what are the types of pharmaceuticals that you are disposing of? And particularly the ones going down the drain. The thing here is that when we are throwing antibiotics down the drain of any type, that's going to be leading to antibiotic resistance in um, bacteria and other pathogens out there that can then come back and affect human health. So there's one um, particular area of concern. Another question that we wanted to know was, okay, if, if disposal is a key component, and we have 7% of people throwing things straight down into the wastewater stream, dumping their unused liquids or pills down the street, down the drain, why are they doing that? And we asked, like, are you getting information about how to properly dispose from your healthcare providers? And we're seeing that the majority of people are not getting any information from their provider, which is the primary source of contact when you are getting your prescription. 
we aren't getting information from our physicians or our veterinarians or the pharmacist. So here's one key piece of how do we intervene in the system to minimize the disposal question. All right, so here we are with these sources that we know about. And after going out and interviewing physicians and pharmacists to ask them about their opinions on pharmaceuticals in the wastewater and entering in the lake in particular, we were trying to figure out, okay, how do we um, approach this problem? And some of the key things we came out with were, well, okay, disposal regulations are kind of all over the place. There's no information in the little pamphlet that comes with your bottle of pills. There's never a place on there. I had a student go out and look through all of the um, 54 drugs that we found entering Lake Champlain. Zero of the packaging had any information about how to dispose properly. So we aren't being given that information clearly when we actually are, are purchasing the drugs. Um, we have a lot of leftover medication, right? 60% of the people had some amount of unused pharmaceutical. So that suggests that we are over prescribing or over dispensing in some way from the pharmacy. Um, the actual number that comes to you, many ways it's because it's cost effective, or you can go to a, um, the store and buy a giant jug full of aspirin or ibuprofen and you maybe only need a smaller amount, or when, you, when something is being prescribed to you, it might not work for you, and you might go back pretty quickly and need a different type of drug. So we can think about that as a system with our healthcare professionals. How do we minimize that over-prescribing piece and the over-dispensing piece as well? And then clinicians also said that they feel a lot of pressure from people coming into them when they're presenting with illness and requesting drugs. And when you only have 15 minutes to speak to your, your patient, you don't have a lot of time to identify some other behavioral changes that could be made that would improve the health of the person without requiring a pharmaceutical. So these were some of the insights that we were getting from those interviews. But the key point that we walked away from with this is that human excretion of medication is the primary source that we're seeing. So let's sit with that for a minute. And now we're going to look at briefly, so what? So there are these pharmaceuticals going out into the lake. What does this mean? And we don't know for sure what it means for Lake Champlain. Um, I have a freezer full of fish that folks over at SUNY Plattsburgh helped me to get as a, a secondary harvest from work that they were doing. And we're planning on having those analyzed to see are pharmaceuticals bioaccumulating? Because again, we are seeing nationally that these things are bioaccumulating throughout the food chain. And some of the information that we've gotten nationally um, are that, yes, there's this concern that pharmaceuticals out in these surface waters, lakes, and streams are having these subtle effects. And some of those effects are starting way at the base of the food chain with Daphnia, the zooplankton, the very base of the food chain that the fish eat. And they, when they are in the presence of certain types of pharmaceuticals, are changing their reproductive behavior and their social behavior so that they are becoming less available at the times when the fish are looking for them to feed, for example. Uh, fish themselves, we have seen bioaccumulation, particularly in, um, in brain. Uh, materials because of the fat solubility of many pharmaceuticals, and that changes the behavior of fish, for example. And more recently, and relating back again to this bigger question of water and some of the things that Jane was bringing up with water and what's in the water, um, we're seeing the connection between drinking water and wastewater once again that we saw through history, where 25 municipal drinking water systems across the country were tested by the US Geological Survey two years ago for pharmaceutical presence. 100% of the samples had some amount of pharmaceutical coming through the drinking water. So this is the water that had already been treated. Very small doses. Public health community says that we don't want to create alarm or to be overly concerned about this because we don't know what it means. We don't know what it means to have these incredibly small doses of pharmaceutical coming through the drinking water, but they are present. So should we be concerned? There's no clear pathway forward for how to approach this. But 
I personally am curious, well, what can we do about this? How do we minimize the amount of pharmaceuticals that are cycling through this system? And the key point of intervention is at, at the source, because with wastewater treatment, well, okay, we could put millions of dollars into our one wastewater treatment plant here that we've tested, but it still wouldn't be able to remove all of these drugs because we don't actually have globally, we have not yet identified um, mechanisms for removing these chemicals from the water. So we could put a lot of money into it, but it's not going to solve the problem. We can work on these questions that the clinicians were helping us with, pharmacists and um, providers who are writing prescriptions. We can think about different ways of prescribing. We can think about dispensing in smaller quantities. We can think about educating people about disposal right at the source. Those are all things that we can work on, and those are considered low-hanging fruit. We can hit those pieces. We can also turn towards some integrative approaches to health, um, looking at some of the other opportunities out there that we're seeing more and more research on the validity of using, for example, acupuncture to treat pain rather than treating with opioids and other types of chemicals. So there are different types of um, medical modalities available to help us minimize the use of pharmaceuticals. But we can also take these community approaches to health, and this is where it all kind of comes back together. This is um, a, a campaign that's been going on through the American Public Health Association, the Vermont Public Health Association, and the Vermont Department of Health has been pushing this as well. There are three behaviors that cause the four diseases that kill 50% of Vermonters. 50% of Americans. And these behaviors are physical inactivity, so not getting enough exercise, poor diet, and smoking. So a little bit of information here. We are not, as Vermonters, getting the recommended level of physical activity. We are not, as Vermonters, getting the recommended level of fruits and vegetables. These things alone have a huge impact on our health that would minimize our reliance on the medical system to try to recoup that health. And to throw it in there, we have 18% of our population, or 16% of our adult population are tobacco users, are smoking. But again, focusing on that, the physical activity and um, and diet pieces, these pieces in particular have a huge impact on the environment in these co-benefit ways that we've been bringing up before. So I want to cycle back here to this idea of sustainability and being this interplay between ecological flourishing, the well-being of our environments, and human flourishing, our own health and happiness, and remembering that these pieces of human flourishing are very much dependent upon having a healthy environment. And a healthy environment can play a role in all of these different components that relate to our human actions and thinking about physical activity and appropriate uh, intake of nutrients and healthy foods have a tremendous impact on the environment in turn. So, for example, if we can provide more infrastructure for active transportation, some of the things that Jen was bringing up with that last piece of the pie, how do we in increase our walking and biking and decrease our use and dependence upon single occupancy vehicles in particular, but on vehicles in general, we can increase physical activity and have a tremendous impact on the level of carbon emissions that are coming out of that transportation. Walking has minimal impact compared to driving. Biking has minimal impact compared to driving. And it really increases our, our physiological health. Likewise, providing access to green spaces, which we saw as a theme in Jane's work in the history of Burlington's health. We're seeing that if you live within a quarter mile of a park, you're much more in, in, likely to increase your physical activity because you want to walk to that place, you want to be in that place. And just being physically active, again, is going to improve your health in a way that decreases your reliance upon pharmaceuticals, for example, in the things that I'm interested in. 
And finally, if we can promote sustainable food systems, this again is a tremendous opportunity for minimizing our reliance on production, production systems that come from miles away and have a huge carbon footprint on the transportation piece alone, fitting into the transportation of Vermont um, that we heard earlier. So there are many different possibilities and many different directions that can be taken for trying to incorporate healthy behaviors that also can improve the health of the environment, which in turn improves our health again. These are just a few examples. And I'm going to leave you with um, one recommended resource, which I only recently came upon, but it's um, through the Vermont Department of Health. You can go to their website and, and download this Vermont Healthy Community Design Resource, which which specifically talks about active living, so physical activity, and healthy eating. And it pulls together a lot of these different pieces for how towns around Vermont can approach these questions of improving the environment while also improving our own health. So I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm going to turn it back over to Walt for a moment. And we'll wrap up with a few questions, if possible. I think um, what I'm going to ask, actually, in, 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 in light of the time, it's a little after 8, and healthy sleep is key, right? So, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm really grateful to all the students who came down the hill uh, today, so thank you for that, and, and everybody in Christine's class. So what I'm going to ask, if it's okay, is our specialist to stick around just for a few minutes, if you, because there's a lot uh, there, and I really want to thank everybody. I just love the way it fit together with the past, present, and future that you left us with. So if the presenters wouldn't mind sticking around for a few minutes, if you have questions, please don't hesitate uh, to come down uh, and, and chat with folks. Um, if you have ideas for future Burlington Geographic presentations, please let me know as well. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it an evening right now, and thanks again to Main Street Landing and uh, RTM. Thank thanks for coming.